let us open our ears and hearts to hear God's word from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus asks, but to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet, wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. And Jesus continued to talk to the crowds in verses 18 and 19, 28 and 29. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us give thanks to God. Let us pray. God, we gather today weary of so many things. Each day we wake to the news of more cases and deaths from COVID-19. We are weary of the dissonance between our nation's celebration of freedom and the pursuit of happiness and the reality of systemic racism. Yet your son still calls us to come to him and seek shelter. We pray this day that your word will activate us so that we may find rest for our weary souls and courage to serve by your spirit as agents of change in the world. Amen. In today's scripture lesson, Jesus gathers the crowds and expresses his weariness of this generation who are like children in a marketplace that hear music yet do not dance, who hear wails and do not mourn. He then turns his attention to his personal experience of false witness. He laments his own rejection by people who name him a glutton and a drunkard who associates with the wrong sort of people, those tax collectors and those sinners, the people that they try to distance themselves from. Yet Jesus labels himself wisdom whose deeds will bring the good news that God in this time and place and for this generation is on the move. Earlier, before addressing this crowd, Jesus had summoned his disciples and given them authority to cure every disease and he had sent them out as sheep among the wolves. A change is gonna come. Yet by the end of the gospel, the authorities and crowds have rejected and crucified Jesus, the one sent to reveal God's wisdom and ways to the world. The promised change and the coming of God's kingdom for the disciples, for the early church of the gospel writer who struggled to commemorate Jesus' story for future generations and for the church today seemed then and seems now slow in coming. We are not there yet. On this 4th of July weekend, we confront the stark contrast between the ideals and core values set forth in the Declaration of Independence and the current reality of our diseased, ravaged nation that struggles to find health and wholeness. Broken by the sins of racism, this generation is called to a time of reckoning long overdue. This is not a new awareness. 
Prophetic voices have for a long time called out the disparity between who we aspire and claim to be and who we are. One such voice was Frederick Douglass, an abolitionist born into slavery who was championed by Northern anti-slavery societies as a spokesperson for the cause of ending slavery. When the Ladies Anti-Slavery Society of Rochester, New York invited him to give a July 4th speech in 1852, he recognized the irony of addressing a crowd on a holiday commemorating equality for all and opted to speak on July 5th instead. He convicted his audience by recognizing the dissonance of tumultuous joy and jubilee shouts amidst the mournful wails of millions. And he told them, your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought light and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. The 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. A generation later, the lament and mourning continued. Following the Civil War, efforts at reconstruction failed to realize the ideal of freedom for all. Jim Crow laws of the late 19th and 20th century became the new policy of oppression. The poet Joseph Seaman Potter Jr. at the turn of the 20th century lamented, I am so tired and weary, so tired of endless fight, so weary of waiting the dawn and finding endless night. The prophets throughout the ages have spoken. Do we hear their wails? A close friend tells me often of her weariness and tiredness of white people such as me who want her to teach them about something that she says we knew all along but chose to ignore. She says us white progressives talk the talk and organize book discussions and say we want to learn about a topic we admit has long been dismissed or ignored, yet falls short when it comes to authentic self-examination of our own personal complicity in systemic racism. Thankfully, she has not given up on me, and we continue to have often painful and uncomfortable conversations about race. I recently observed the painful and uncomfortable discussions about race at the denominational 224th General Assembly of the PCUSA, where a resolution was passed called Responding to the Sin of Racism and a Call to Action. It declared that Black Lives Matter and confessed the church's complicity in perpetuating injustice. It pledged to confront and dismantle systemic racism. Yet for many, the voiced lamentations and confessions were hollow and did not go far enough to address the urgency of the need for systemic change. After the assembly, some church leaders wrote an open letter to the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church USA, a lamentations rebuke. The co-signers protested the inaction of the recent General Assembly to introduce a statement on the ways that black women and girls are dispor disproportionately affected by the systems of white supremacy and misogyny in communities, the church, and society at large. They recommended creating cultures that stop empowering and start equipping the existing equity accountability systems, like committees on representation or anti-racism commissions already within the church. And on a personal level, they challenged individuals to raise the bar and hold themselves to account in meaningful, 
personal and systemic ways. They close the letter with a postscript to readers. And please do not call any of the signatories to explain yourself or commiserate. Some of us are tired. At this time, spare us from having to appease your guilt. Come, come, all who are weary. Jesus recognized the burdens of his generation and provided an alternative. He summoned them to follow his gentle and heart-filled ways. To this generation, he calls and releases us from the institutional yoke of church and government authority that enslaves and seeks to dominate and separate us. Jesus does not release us from the burden. The burden, the labor is still here. The difficult conversations, the transforming of rhetoric into action remains before us. Yet Christ has not abandoned us. As Paul reminds us in his letter to the Romans, we cannot do this on our own. Christ offers a yoke that directs us to walk in faith, a new path guided by God's mercy and justice. As we stand in the crossroads of human and God's time, we are summoned to embrace the yoke of Christ's authority, for it is only through that submission and repentance that we will find rest for our weary, sin-sick souls. We can, as a church and as individuals with God's help, be transformed into all God imagines us to be. As we sang earlier today, we lament that still children wander homeless, that still the hungry cry for bread, that still the captives long for freedom, that still in grief we mourn our dead. Yet we walk in the faith that the Lord's deep compassion will still heal the sick, free the soul, and use the love the Spirit kindles to save and make us whole. And by God's grace, may it be so. Amen.